Hi everyone, this is Greg Hunt. I'm a mediator, a trainer and host of No Disputing That, a podcast for anyone with an interest in dispute resolution. In this series, I sit down with some of the leading names in the dispute resolution field to discuss mediation, arbitration and other forms of alternative dispute resolution, which we also call ADR. We may even cover other issues in the law and in life in general. Expect some laughs, some honesty, and quite a few editing errors along the way. In this episode, I'm sitting down with Matt Gatenby, senior partner at Travel Law Experts Travel Law, where he has over 20 years of experience in the travel law industry. You all right, Matt? I'm very good, thank you, Greg. Very good. Thanks for thanks for having me, and thanks for making me sound so young. That's all right. Twenty years. I've got twenty seven years now. I think it's yeah, twenty seven. It's, it's not a competition. Yeah, you've got more hair than me. Um, no, only just <laughs> now, Matt. I know you as being friendly and approachable when we've met each other before, and mainly at ABTA events. Um, I know you're very proud um, that you um, operate in the travel industry that your company and yourself you serve tour operators travel agents trade associations insurers underwriters um you do all sorts of travel work and we're going to touch on that in a moment um you specialize in regulatory advice commercial drafting and high value litigation you're also a trainer and a speaker and that's where we've worked together before um particularly on the the apta road shows in uh, well london and manchester i think we've uh, We've done the most together. Um, so it's no surprise I've asked you to appear on No Disputing That uh, today. And I look forward to having a good conversation with you. Um, if you want to know more about Matt or Trav Law, then um, they're easily Googleable. And I'll ask Matt in, in a minute to give you his email address if he wants to, so you can contact him direct. Um, so now the intros are done. How are you doing, Matt? Are you uh, relaxed and looking forward to a full day at work? Oh, always. Always. It's uh, at the time of recording, it's the middle of the week. So we've got the difficult Monday out of the way. The difficult Friday when everything seems to really go off all at once for one reason or another is is still ahead of us. But uh, yeah. every day is a challenge, but uh, we enjoy it, don't we? We do. We do. That's why we do it. So what what's a typical day at the office for you these days? So forget forget that COVID's happened, which is impossible. And as we were talking just before we started recording, I've got COVID in the house this week. Um, so it is still there and it is still happening. But what, what's a typical day in the office these days for Matt Gatenby? Well, um, one of the one of the beauties about working in the space that, that we work in, which is this kind of slightly, uh, some people think it's slightly unusual. I don't, I don't think it is. We're, we're a law firm at the end of the day. So we, we have clients and, and we serve them. But what it means working in the travel space specifically, because all our clients, as you mentioned, are, travel and leisure clients of, of one kind or another, and, that, and that's quite a broad church, is that the, no two days are the same. Very rarely, you know, could you could you stack two days up and say, oh, well, you know, it's starting to get a bit repetitive, it's starting to get a bit boring, um, because it, it just rather depends what's going on at any particular time. Now, in fairness, there's usually some kind of theme going on over all themes. So, you know, if, well, the pandemic is the obvious uh, mm. answer, isn't it, that the last two years. The, the majority of what we've done has been the, the legal aspects, the regulatory aspects of advising on the pandemic. But before that, you know, we've had things like, you know, the the illness claims that, that, that oh. were kind of rampant before the pandemic. So sometimes you can kind of be dealing with the same kinds of things. But literally, um, it's very different. And, and and my day tends to vary between actually working on, on matters for clients, giving them the, the advice, depending upon what it is. And then also, you know, working with the team. We've got a very na- nice closely knit team here that um you know i i help to uh to lead and then so there's a lot of supervision training working with them which you know i i really enjoy excellent and uh, don't forget volcanic ash clouds as well I'm, I'm sure you're involved with that at the time um just just before before um for anyone not known the context of the uk travel industry it's been through a few difficult times in recent years um, not, not not least, obviously, with the pandemic, but also before that, we've had the the collapse of Thomas Cook, which was which was huge, and the volcanic ice uh, ash clouds, and lots of other sort of things that would have been keeping you busy, I'm sure, and well, it just makes makes you wonder what's next, doesn't it? Well, quite, and as I said, there's there's, there's always something uh, thematic going on, but I mean, you know, one of the things 
that we talked about a lot during the pandemic is you know getting back to how things were before. I, mean, I think mm. in whatever walk of life, that was probably something that was being said. But the truth is that there's always something like that going on. Very rarely do any of us, you know, enjoy that stability of just having a quote normal and quote run of things where there's nothing really happening and mm. you can just get on with things. That the world is a is a sometimes crazy place, isn't it? So there's there's plenty yeah. of challenges. And when you when you're dealing with an industry that's a global industry, then everything global is going to have an impact on it, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. And you know, again, at the time of recording, was we're seeing what you know, what the effect is of things like inflation. Uh, the, the the difference in in you know dollar to the pound which is 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 bad for some people and then people are unhappy with it but great for other people and they're absolutely kind of banging the table yeah. with joy at the difference it makes so there's there's always winners and losers but yeah it's it's very much a global um, industry now mm. whether it's you know for leisure whether it's for business whether it's for educational purposes and what have you yeah and just just for some more context i think for listeners as well um why am I so interested in this? I'm I'm a, a mediator and I mediate um, across all sectors. Um, but travel is very important to me because I've done a lot of mediation and travel. Um, but also I run the APTA arbitration scheme, my business, Hunt ADR. Um, and, you know, we, we saw massive changes during the last two and a half years. Um, you know, our people, people were often saying, um, oh, it must be really tough. No one's going on holiday. You don't get disputes. And that was right. Um, we saw our um, caseload drop by 70% for two years, um, which, you know, is massively significant. Um, and now I'm getting it, Matt. I wonder if you get this. I'm getting it now where everyone says, God, you must be so busy. Um, everyone's complaining about holidays. And what they seem to forget there is actually we deal with the complaints six to nine months, sometimes 12 months after they've been through the complaints procedure of the tour operator and maybe been to APTA as well. Um, so we've not really seen any increase at all. We're still probably only on about 40% of the caseload that we had before COVID hit. Um, so things take time on the on the sort of the chain to get back into order again. Um, have you found that or have you found that you've been busy as a law firm right the way through? I would say that, that generally speaking, we, we've seen the same as you. Um, you you're, you're, you're exactly right. There is a, a delay because, you know, disputes are disputes. And first of all, that, you know, that whatever's going to happen uh, that causes the dispute in the first place has happened. A bad holiday, a bad experience, some kind of breach of contract or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as with most forms of ADR, there is an attempt or, or a suggestion or a requirement for the parties to try and resolve things first so first of all you know in a in a holiday and leisure context people have got to get back then you know they, they've kind of got to get back into their run of life some people are straight to their computer firing off emails some people take a bit more time um but again you know the holiday company and the, and the customer which is usually the, the the relationship there um will have a will have a go at trying to resolve it out then uh, adr might step in so as you say one way or another, whether or, whether or not it's someone escalating a complaint into something, you know, what a bit more serious and a bit heavy-handed and demanding that the MD gets involved, or going down the ADR route, the the after arbitration scheme, or otherwise, or you know, going to the small claims uh, track for to resolve a dispute that way. There are usually months involved before you even get to that stage. Mm -hmm. That aside. Um, yeah, I mean, we've certainly seen the same kind of downturn in terms of because because it's linked, isn't it? It's the same way yeah. that uh, my understanding is is that you know claims relating to um, uh, passenger uh, driver, I should say, um, road traffic incidents uh, mm. went down over the pandemic because we were all working from home or not taking as many car journeys, etc. Right. And that will no doubt come back. Um, dependent upon you know the level of traffic on the roads, but there's there's going to be a delay. So I think that's true of a number of walks of life. Mm. Yeah. And you're well known and your firm is well known in the travel industry for your, the services you provide, which are, are to the what I would call the respondent, the defendant, the, the, mm. the tour operator in 90 percent of the cases, if not more. Um, you're not necessarily that well known for using ADR. Um, and I know that you know, I, I have seen cases where ADR has been used, where travel law is representing um, one of the parties, um, but it's not that often. As a firm, what's your take on the value of mediation and arbitration and maybe 
what do you see as some of the barriers to using it? Because it's not used as well in travel as a whole as it is in maybe other sectors like construction, for example. Yeah, it, it's. I find the entire um, lay of the land here fascinating in terms of of how it goes. I think um, you're right. We, you know, we as a firm, I think we as a, as an industry. I, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I'm pretty sure it's indicative. Probably don't use it as as much as we should, and I think there are a number of reasons for that, um, which I'll come to. But this, despite that, you know, there is a clear. Um, thrust isn't there from from the from the lawmakers to have more ADR in place as a, as yeah. a you know rather than people trogging off to court and, and and with everything that that um, brings and we do actually use various forms of ADR whether it is arbitration or mediation um, quite a lot but of course it's a private um, affair. It's it's mm-hmm. not usually something that will be talked about openly, and indeed there may be confidentiality issues. So it probably does work um, more than, than than what is apparent from the outside. But you're right. I'm I'm, I'm not going to try and say that it's it's to the same level as you see in, in other um, industries. I think maybe the reasons for that is that there's no one overarching you know scheme or requirement, um, and also the the way that the travel industry works is that the arbitration is it's. Actually, there are schemes out there and there are abilities um, out there to to have, you know, limited company to limited company or or PLC, if you like, arbitration schemes. But usually the arbitration here, because it's to do with with travel and a consumer buying travel. Consumer is is one part of the um, of the equation out there, there, as you say, usually they're kind of claimant. And so there is usually not the same level of requirement. It can't be coded in as the same way as it can, you know, for instance, in a in a contractual agreement between two corporate parties, you can you can agree to, to have a, a form of ADR mandated. And that's more difficult in, in I think, the consumer sphere. So at, at the moment, I, I agree with all that. At the moment, there are, there are talks, and it looks like it's quite likely going to happen, that mediation is going to be made mandatory for claims under £10,000. Mm. Um, do you think... The industry, I'm not talking about you, <laughs> the, the industry as a whole will find ways to avoid doing that. Or do you think it's something that people will say, OK, there's there's a level of we have to do this. Let's get involved and do it and, and make the best we can. And actually, if it works, then it could actually have a major effect further down the line on, on people like yourself as a law firm um, where, you know, you could find that some of the work drops off because mediation has been successful. I know you don't necessarily particularly get involved in a lot of cases under £10,000, um, but just as a general sort of question for, for the industry, really. Well, my my observation is that I think that the travel industry uh, are very open to that. And, and I have, and we have at Travel, I've been big fans of the of the small claims mm. mediation scheme that's that's been in place for years now. Um, you know, it started off as a pilot and was, you know, in our eyes, extremely useful, extremely successful. And I don't really have um, any bad words to say about it. It has the amount of cases that we've seen that fall into that bracket where you thought there is not a cat in hell's chance that this is is going to resolve because, the you know, the parties are too entrenched only for the small claims mediation uh, scheme to, to, to provide an answer. And, you know, again, it's that classic... ADR situation, isn't it? Where, well, not necessarily the case that everyone's completely happy. Therefore, it's a it's a success. But we we've got a resolution that that's been agreed, and that's great. Yeah. And I think making it mandatory, it's kind of it's not been mandatory in the small claims track, but you know, Ooh. it's certainly been heavily touted, and and I would have no issue with that. I think the only caveat to that is that um, sometimes, and we probably. I can't speak for other industries as much. So maybe yeah. this doesn't come up as much, but we certainly see situations where despite despite the fact that you can make the very clear and, and, and correct argument that a dispute is a dispute and there's usually something in it, um, it very rarely is, is one side, one party making things up. So you're talking about shades of grey. Nevertheless, I think in our particular uh, sphere of operations, you do see situations where a claim can be completely defended genuinely whether it's on a point of law or otherwise so trying to you know look at adr of any form in a situation where one party says look we're completely in the right 
why should we you know give any ground um is is going to be difficult mm. and, and of course the counter argument to that is well you would say that and perhaps the mm. other side is saying the same therefore perfect for for mediation or, or yeah. of some kind so so it is tricky but we do see that a lot because again maybe it's the subject matter you know travel particularly the leisure side of travel is people's dreams is you know the trip of a lifetime is is very yeah. emotional as well and yeah. so it, it can lead to some strange outcomes sometimes but generally speaking i think more power to the to the um efforts to make adr more of a factor than it currently is yeah yeah i agree my, my concern is more along not, it's not about mediation itself um and i was asked this question on a on a webinar yesterday and as as hunt adr we didn't do a reply to the consultation about mandatory mediation and the reason for that was because i just couldn't make my mind up and i was i was writing the the response and i was thinking this doesn't make sense because you can't actually decide whether you're in favor or not um and so I think for me, the door is very, very wide open, um, but I'm not 100% sure. And, and it's not necessarily mediation that's the issue. I worry about the administration, about the um, follow up, about the education um, to people, about the availability, last minute cancellations. Um, mm -hmm. I also worry about the fact that for, for 20 years now, there have been you know, arguably and I'm doing the inverted commas sign here that you can't see, too many mediators and not enough mediations. Um, and if it goes down the mandatory route, we might find ourselves in a situation where we've got too many mediations and not enough mediators. Um, and specifically, those mediators who have made a career out of mediation won't want to do those mandatory mediations because the money won't be any good. Um, so I'm, I'm worried about the whole infrastructure of making it mandatory rather than the, whether mediation itself is something that is good to do. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. I agree. It needs to be done right. I think my my kind of final point on that is it, it's always good to have options. Mm. Um, and, and the more options that there are for people to 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 legitimately to be able to look to and use is is good. But but I totally agree. There's a big training piece and knowledge piece on that because I think there is sometimes a bit of an odd kind of people look slightly askance at uh, the, the form of ADR and, and that's kind of put before them and say, well, you know, I'll, I'll just take my chances at court and, and skip that. And, you know, the more that they have to play with there, the more they have to be able to look at, I think mm. is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Right. You're based in Leeds, Matt. Yes. Are they going down? <laughs> Well, you, you're asking the wrong person here because whilst whilst we're based in Leeds, I'm a I'm a paid up Bradford fan, so I don't really want to talk about football, and neither do you, by the way. At the current time, let's not get into that. Um, yeah. So I'd probably best take take the faith on that one. Yeah, just just for personal safety. <laughs> well, you, the, there is part of that. Um, yeah. They've had, I mean, in fairness, Leeds have had a, a good thing going, and they're going through a, a rough spell. It's the it's the kind of you know second season phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. They need to play Liverpool quickly and then, then they'll get a win, you know, do, do a forest. There are um, there are a few things um, that, that equate to an, an easy instant win, but I agree that probably is one of them at the current yeah, time. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I'm, as, as a Liverpool fan, I'm, I'm pretty confident we will improve. Um, so, you know, it's been a bad start, but we will we'll get there in the end. Um, whatever there is. Yeah. As, as someone who was raised in the 80s I don't see top four as being success you know winning something is success not just finishing fourth um, so we'll, we'll see what we can judge success at at the end of the year um, a winning a win in Amsterdam tonight will do well um, are you watching the Rugby uh, League World Cup at all are you going to any games do you know I haven't mentioned it uh, I've, I've kind of kept an interested interested eye in because yeah. um, I, I, I think they're just always great games, and any and any World Cup is is usually good. But there's, I mean, and the the opportunity to see teams that you would not have any chance of seeing either on TV or, or in live in some of the local venues. You know, who mm. who doesn't want to see uh, Papua New Guinea take down the Cook Islands? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of the games. I mean, Lebanon winning the other night that was uh, a good game. I'm I'm going to Hull next weekend to watch a game there. I went to uni in Hull. So me and my best mate, who was my best man, who we lived together at uni, we're, we're going back to Hull uh, to watch a game there. But we, we don't know who's playing yet. It's a, it's a quarter-final. 
Yeah, uh, so yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, and, and let me just say, you know, nothing against the, the good people of the Cook Islands. I just use it as an example. But, you know, we love, <laughs> I don't want the people of the Cook Islands to suddenly, like, dis dislike me. Well, we love you guys. Yeah. Great game. <laughs> Great. Right, is there anything else you want to um, talk about that maybe I've not asked you about? Any burning issues in travel at the moment that you think might be worth raising? I think from a from an ADR point of view, which I, I know is where, you know, obviously your particular mm -hmm. interest goes. I think, you know, revisiting that point of having options for, you know, people with disputes of, of any nature within the, the travel industry is mm. good because, um, again, I, I I find it hard to criticise, you know, um, His Majesty's uh, Courts and Tribunal Service <laughs> because they've got a, a tough job with an ever-increasing workload. Mm. And, you know, from a very practical point of view, you know, our clients want they don't they don't no one enjoys being in litigation no one enjoys being in disputes so you know what is needed is is a way to kind of get these things resolved one way or the other and sometimes there's no there's nothing for it you're going to end up in a in a court scenario there's going to be a final determination um by a judge or otherwise but these things can take a long time so you know i know that um for instance you mentioned the APTA scheme you know the the, the resolution uh, time frame the aim for that is is really quick uh, certainly yeah. you know, only only by comparison to you know i remember first doing it you know probably was about that 20 years ago mark um and it wasn't slow then but certainly it's yeah. it's kind of come on leaps and bounds that i think is what we as an industry and, and dare i say other industries will want to see um because everyone's a winner right yeah and and you're right the the time scale for an ab to claim from when it sort of lands on my doorstep in effect uh, to the publication of the award is 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's a lot quicker. Um, you know, it depends. So the, the the claim comes in, hopefully with all the supporting documentation. And um, so within a couple of days, that's sent off to the tour operator. And they have 28 days to put a defence in. But if they do the defence after seven days, we don't hang around. We, we go to the next stage. So, you know, you could have an arbitrator appointed and actually dealing with the award within four or five weeks um, and, you know, get the award published within five or six weeks. So, yeah, it can be very, very quick. Um, and I think it's a model. I asked um, Owen Lawrence on a previous podcast about, you know, people talk about mediation a lot and mandatory mediation. No one ever talks about arbitration in the same way. Mm -hmm. And if you look, like, look at schemes like the APTA scheme, there's a model there that if that had some sort of mandate, would potentially even be more successful than mediation because it always ends up with a legally bounding outcome where, of course, at mediation, you might not get a settlement. Um, but it's never really talked about in the same way. And I think people often think, well, arbitration um, is going to be a lot more expensive than mediation would. But it's not necessarily true if you're doing it under a scheme arrangement. Um, so that's something I've, I've considered. Arbitration could be used more than it is. Um, oh, across different sectors absolutely and in, and in the kind of larger you know bigger ticket arbitrations where you've got you know much more dare i say significant case you know you you've got various um bodies out there that that you know because often agreements will just say things like you know the parties agree to arbitration in london and that's it that's all you yeah. get to work with so again but there are bodies out there that that, that can be used and those kind of turnaround times are possible. That kind of determination is possible. How mm. how much force and effect it's got is, is another thing. But as I say, it comes back to that point about options. And I think that is something that what you just described makes all the sense in the world. And there are various types of other ADR. I just, you know, from my point of view, it's sometimes been hard to get those in. You know, we've always liked the idea of something like early neutral evaluation. Yeah. We find it very difficult to persuade anybody to 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 put the time and, and money into it mm. and probably because you don't get that ultimate determination even though that's kind of what it's aiming for yeah yeah excellent thank you matt that i, I found that really interesting um i hope other people will do as well when they when they hear it um so thank you for taking the time to join me today no oh, thank you for having me it's been an, an absolute pleasure and um, you know the, the work that you do in the in the ADR space is is amazing, and more power to you, Greg. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers.
Thank you for listening to No Dispute in That. Please subscribe to hear more from experts in the field. If you'd like to suggest any future areas for discussion or to appear on the show yourself, you can follow us on Twitter at at no disputing that and send us a DM. Finally, if you need a mediator, give my management team at Arbiter International a call on 020 7936 7070 or email info at arbitra.co.uk. See you next time on No Disputing That.